So the title of the talk is how to exploit correlation in multi-user uh, wireless networks. So here, maybe I should specify what I mean by uh, correlation. So here, it's, uh, I mean, correlation can be in many, can uh, appear in many faces and can be used for many different purposes. But here, specifically, I'll be talking about correlation in uh, sources. <laughs> so in terms of uh, how to compress these sources in a distributed manner and how to basically to, uh, transmit this correlated information over a wireless network. So it's very common that uh, we, these nodes in the network have some correlated observations, and there are many applications. Here I just uh, listed a few. So the one uh, would be, for instance, distributed video networks. Some cameras, multiple cameras, uh, recording the same scene will have some correlation in the, uh, in the packets, in the video packets they, they record. And or in sensor networks, we all know that it's make sure that the sensor knows this to be in a geographical uh, area, uh, recording some uh, physical phenomena will have some correlation uh, among their observations. Or, I mean, in these two cases, for instance, this correlation is coming from the, the data itself. So it's naturally kind of nature, uh, naturally appearing in this uh, the recorded information. But also, it can be created within the network, such as in this peer-to-peer -peer networks, where if you have this one video uh, source transmitted over the network, but uh, some nodes might have actually some parts of the data available at them from previous transmissions, etc. Or in uh, relay networks, in the in, in wireless uh, networks, they can have some correlated information, some parts of the data available, which uh, we might want to use for uh, future transmissions to improve the performance. Okay, so so basically, in general, I'll be talking about this, like transmitting a source from uh, observing the source, uh, compressing it, and transmitting over the wireless links. So in general, basically, this is a joint source channel coding problem. So we are interested in the end-to-end -end performance, both uh, considering the compression and the transmission side. So we don't care specifically how to improve the capacity of the network or how to best uh, compress the sources. We are interested in the end-to-end -end, uh, performance. And when you talk about joint source channel coding problems, the first thing is, of course, uh, that comes into uh, mind is to uh, separation theorem, which I will talk uh, in, in detail later. But, but basically, separation means that you apply compression first, so get rid of the redundancy in the source, and then do channel coding afterwards. And uh, it's known that actually, at least theoretically, it was shown uh, that this is optimal in certain scenarios. But the general uh, the theme of this talk is that there are many cases that actually this is suboptimal, even theoretically. And so basically, we'll try to come up with ways how to improve the performance uh, when this is the case, when uh, separation is uh, suboptimal. So there are some uh, kind of famous examples, I would say, to prove this, the suboptimality of the separation. The first one is multiple access channel with correlated sources. So if you have, for instance, like two sources, S1 and S2, coming from this uh, joint distribution as here. So basically, you have all possible combinations, but the, the zero one combination with equal probability. And your goal is to transmit these two sources over this multiple access binary input edit, uh, edit, addition channel to the receiver, which wants both sources in a reliable manner. So if you look at, so now uh, separation says that, okay, you first compress the sources, get rid of all the redundancy, and then you transmit the sources over this MAC using independent channel inputs. In that case, if you look at this channel with uh, independent channel inputs, you can at most transmit one and a half bits over channel use, even if uh, it, the, the, the sum rate you can transmit over this channel. But on the other hand, the, the joint entropy of the sources, so even if you compress these sources uh, jointly in the, the most efficient manner, you get 1.58 bits per sample, which is higher than the this capacity, the sum capacity you can transmit over the channel. So if you constrain yourself to independent channel inputs, which you would get in the case of separation, you would never be able to transmit these sources over this channel. On the other hand, it's, it's very easy to see that actually in this channel, if you simply put the sources to the, uh, input the, the sources to the channel, each observation, without any coding, your channel will actually just sum the sources. And if you look at uh, this, by just looking at the sum, you can actually construct both sources exactly zero error. So this is just a kind of a toy example showing that. 
uh, can be cases in the multiple uh, multi-user uh, networks that actually this separation is strictly uh, suboptimal compared to different joint uh, the source channel codes. So then, uh, basically that would be cases that are kind of related uh, networks that I'll talk about the rest of the talk. Another scenario where uh, the separation might be suboptimal is the case that, that when you have, uh, when you don't have ironicity either in the source or the channel. There are actually some, uh, so basically this, this, the optimality of separation is limited to uh, ergodic sources and channels. There are some extensions, but uh, in principle, that's the case. We can uh, we can say, but for instance, uh, in many practical scenarios, like for for example, transmitting video over wireless links, you have delay constraints because of the nature of the application. So you cannot wait infinitely long amount of time to transmit a video packet. But on the other hand, you can have a, a fading channel. So your channel might be changing from one state, to uh, one block to another in a, in a random fashion. And you might not have the, the, uh, the state of the channel, the, the instantaneous state of the channel available at the transmitter. So in that case, your transmitter observes the source. So now it wants to compress the source and transmit over the channel, but it doesn't know what is the rate it can transmit at that instant. So it has to pick a rate in a random manner. And then transmit and hope that it will either go or it will be, that will be outages. So there is a trade-off. It, it can, if it compresses too much, uh, then maybe more, more packets will go, but the, the quality will be bad. But if you, if you compress less, then, the, then you, have to trans, you have to have a higher transmission rate over the channel, and you will lose many packets, while the remaining packets will have high quality. So in this case, basically, the separation, there is no uh, separation theorem, and you have to come up with some statistical uh, joint source channel transmission scheme. This is uh, basically this, this kind of setup is what I've done in my PhD. So if somebody is interested in this kind of thing, problems, I can, uh, we can talk about later, but this is not going to be very So what is the situation for the channel being non-ergodic? So channel is a, a block fading uh, model. So it, 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 for each block of n channel users, you assume it's constant, but you don't know it to transmit. Right. So, and you have to transmit within that block. Oh, you have to transmit. Yeah, so because of the delay limitation of the source. Yeah, so I mean, basically you cannot average out the effect of fading, so that's why it's the, uh, another very channel for each packet. Okay. So now let's go back to the, the very principles. So I assume, uh, more or less, uh, most people are familiar with uh, information theory, so I'll quickly go over this. Uh, joint source channel coding and uh, the separation theorem. And I will introduce some actually uh, a very simple result, which I really think is, I think maybe uh, not many people are familiar with it. And I think it's, it's kind of a nice result, which I will use uh, in the rest of the talk. So this is the fundamental problem of information theory. So you have a source S coming from some uh, promoter distribution PS, and the goal is to transmit this over a noisy channel from X to Y characterize it as this conditional distribution to the receiver. So we are now I will talk about uh, lossless uh, transmission, meaning that we want this error probability going to zero. We can, I will also later talk about uh, lossy uh, coding. We will introduce some uh, distortion and reconstruction, basically. So from an engineering point of view, what we need to design is the encoder that observes a block of source samples, SM, and needs to uh, transform this into a channel that put XM. So in general, we can have, of course, a mismatch between, between the source block length and the channel block length. It doesn't have to be equal. And we call this here for this problem as N over M, the rate, the source channel rate of the system. So the goal is, of course, uh, uh, for, for any rate to let this uh, error probability go to zero as the block length N and M go to infinity while we fix the ratio of this. And then M to the, the source channel rate. And once, so we are given a source and a channel, what we want to do is to find the minimum source channel rate, meaning minimum number of channel users we need to transmit per source sample to transmit this source S to the destination. Of course, if you are in any channel with uh, like any positive capacity, by using it as more and more times, you can transmit any source over this channel. But the goal is to minimize this uh, source channel rate. So this, I said, is the fundamental problem of information theory, although we don't generally see this as in the, the introductory courses in information theory. We start with first the channel coding problem, which is actually a special case of this problem. If you let this S 
to be a, for instance, a binary uh, binary source with equal uh, uh, this one half distribution. Then uh, this is actually the, the source channel rate is the inverse of the channel capacity. The, the minimum capacity we need to transmit this uh, uniform source, minimum source channel rate. Sorry. Or if we let the channel to be a binary uh, binary channel, binary uh, channel with uh, zero uh, error probability, basically zero crossover probability, then it's the basically we need to find the, the, the channel that's, that has the, the uh, sorry, the number, the minimum number of channel users we need to transmit the source which is the, the source coding problem, how much you should compress your source. So, but why do we, even though this is the most general problem, why do we actually look into these two separate cases? Don't we lose any uh, optimality by looking at this, this kind of sub-problems? The, the, the answer is no, we don't actually, uh, due to channels, source channel separation theorem. So this theorem says that you can actually, for any given this kind of problem, you can break the problem into two. So you can first compress the source S, get rid of all the redundancy, which is the source coding problem, and then transmit these compressed bits over the channel using the optimal channel code. And now the goal is to find the, the best channel code, which is the channel coding problem. So this is basically what we have been doing. And we kind of, the community is also divided into two. There are people working on to develop the, the best source codes. There are people working on to, uh, to develop best channel codes. And actually, when you put them together, basically, you still get the, uh, the optimal end-to-end -end performance. So this is very good. Why? Because, first of all, it brings modularity. So now you are giving one source, one channel. You, you design your source code and channel code. And if the channel changes, you don't need to come up with a different source channel code for every time you change the channel. For the same source, you can just change the channel code for the new channel and still get the optimal performance. So this is uh, kind of the idea behind all this layering uh, in the, the uh, in the network there. So you can first compress your sources. You, can, you just need a, a source source code for different applications, but you can still use the underlying uh, channel code for the same, as long as the channel remains the same. And of course, now that uh, once, for instance, for any new setup, if you if the, the source channel separation theorem is proven, then now you can go get some of these already existing new optimal LDPC, turbo code, whatever it is optimal for the channel, and just plug it into your system and get the optimal performance. But of course, there is a but in all the, uh, these nice uh, theoretical results. This is, uh, this is true in theory, meaning that we, we assume, as in most information theory results, infinite delay, infinite co uh, unlimited complexity in the system, and as I said, limited to ergodic sources and channels, and only point-to-point -point systems. So these are, uh, in general, very limiting. For the point-to-point -point case, we can say that we now have near optimal practical codes. So in that sense, maybe we can say, that, OK, still we can put these practical near optimal source and channel codes and get something closer to the optimal. But in many real uh, life uh, applications that are important, especially for today, wireless networks, we have either these delayed constraint sources, which, uh, which basically we don't have this ergodic channel anymore, or we have uh, Pretty much everywhere we have this multi-user setup, but we don't have the separation. So we have to somehow come up with uh, new schemes for these scenarios. Okay, so now let's look at the go back to this correlation in the network. So this is the, the simplest setup where you can have correlation. This is the point-to-point -point system where you have the source S you want to transmit. Now the receiver has this uh, side information T, which is correlated, meaning that coming from some arbitrary joint distribution PST. So it was shown by Shamai and Merdu that actually in this setup, separation is still optimal. Meaning that you can compress your source S using slipping of compression. So basically you uh, bin your sources into 2 to the n H S given T, the conditional entropy H S given T bins, and simply transmit the bin index over the channel. And then uh, the, the decoder receiving the bin index looks at within that bin Looks at, uh, finds the source that's jointly typical with its uh, side information and reconstructs the, uh, the the source S. So basically, for this setup, even though there is this additional correlated side information, we still have this uh, source channel separation. But instead of now comp uh, just sending the compressing the source S by itself, we basically transmit the bin index, meaning that we need to transmit less information, only the remaining part of S, given the receiver has T over the channel. So it requires a uh, smaller capacity channel compared to the case where there is no sign information. 
But doing that to do pinning, can we do this uh, without pinning somehow? So this is the this is the kind of this nice result that uh, I was talking about. Actually, it turns out that if you have it, when you don't have the channel, you have to do the pinning. So for slapping involved coding, the achievability there is as far as I know there is no uh, achievability result without doing pinning. But in the case of uh, when you have a channel, it turns out that the channel, so, channel sort of does the binning for you. So how do we do this? So you have all the, all the source outcomes, all possible source, source outcomes you list uh, here. And then you generate one channel code word for each of them coming from this uh, distribution PX, uh, IID, length and uh, channel code words. And once you have, the, when you observe at the encoder your source uh, outcome, you just find the corresponding channel input and just translate that. So this is as simple as that. You don't do any binning, nothing. Basically, the, now the the code kind of the the complexity is transferred to the to the decoder. Now your decoder, observing the channel output, needs to find the index i such that the the corresponding uh, channel input for i should be joined with uh, typical with the channel output, while in the same time. The, uh, the source outcome for that index should be jointly typical with the side information. So basically, the decoder uses both the side information and the channel output in a joint fashion to, uh, to recover the, uh, the source outcome. And it turns out it can actually achieve the same performance as doing uh, slip involved coding followed by uh, channel coding. So the, here, as I, I, I told about this joint decoding, you can also uh, break it into two. The same principle, basically, the, the Channel decoder. You can still have a channel decoder, but instead of having a unique decoder, your channel decoder actually might output a list of uh, channel inputs that are candidates that are all jointly typical with the output. Since now your code has a higher length, uh, higher size than what you can transmit over the channel, that will be a list instead of a unique uh, channel decoder. And then the, the source decoder looks among this list and finds the one. Uh, whose corresponding source outcome is jointly typical with the side information. So basically now, uh, with this coding scheme, what we have done is uh, we transfer the complexity from the, so we simplify the encoding and transfer the, the complexity of the, the system to the decoder. And, okay, so this is what I said. So basically, if we, once we generate all the, the source outcomes, we can either bin them into 2 to the NHS given T, which would be the separation approach as in the slipping mode, or on the extreme, we don't bin at all, or it's kind of the same thing as saying all the bins have size 1, so there's only one uh, convert in each bin. Or actually, it turns out we can actually have any bin size in between. So you can actually have 2 to the M M R R bins, as long as this R is greater than the condition natural BHST, as given T, you can still uh, do basically uh, achieve the same optimal and optimal performance. So the advantage is now we have this continuum of different coding schemes by changing this R, uh, R value. So, and in this general scheme, basically we have separation and we have joint decoding as two extremes and we can have anything in between. Okay, so this is nice kind of theoretically, but uh, so what? It doesn't have any advantage. So one thing, as I said, for instance, in a sensing network, if you don't want your sensor to do all this binning, et cetera, separate, separate source compression, channel coding, you can actually uh, use this kind of approach and you, you transfer all the complexity to the decoder. Uh, the access point can do all this uh, high complexity decoding uh, things. And it turns out, actually, also, aside from this practical advantage in the point-to-point -point scenario, there are actually multiple uh, multi-user systems that this kind of coding might be required. So this is an example, and I, I will talk more about uh, another setup later. So consider, for instance, now you are broadcasting your source S to two receivers over a broadcast channel from X to Y1, Y2, and each receiver has a different quality side information. So this one has T1, this one has T2, and we don't, it can be that this uh, T1 may be very similar to S, but the channel from X to Y1 is very bad, etc. So if you apply separation, now you want, basically, you want to transmit each user the remaining part of the source. So now since you are broadcasting, you, you have to kind of trans, transmit to the user which has the worst quality side information. So you need to compress to the worst quality side information. 
But then, when transmitting this over the channel, you have to channel code for the worst channel so that both of them receive. And in that case, basically, you have to uh, you lose for both the this, uh, in terms of the source coding and uh, both in the in the channel coding. You do for the for the worst uh, in in both stages. But it turns out actually, if doing this joint coding, so if if I don't care about this, the the side information at all, that the encoder. So the encoder, the encoder looks at all the source outcomes and just inputs uh, the corresponding channel code work. And now the decoders do the joint decoding. And now what is important is the joint quality of this channel and the side information. So as long as the remaining part, part for that source is smaller than or equal to the, 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 the channel code rate to that uh, decoder, if, if this is satisfied, then the, uh, the decoder will decode. So. And, and basically, uh, now in the case that the, the, the good channel, uh, the user with the good channel with the bad side information, still the, co the combined quality might be good enough, so, and it might be received as if it's the only receiver. So uh, here, basically, as you can see, uh, if the joint quality are the same for both users, you are doing as if uh, there is no other receiver in the system. And another uh, nice thing here, if you look at this expression, we have the source coding parameters on the left, like H, uh, S, and T, and the channel coding parameters on the right. So there's sort of a separation, even though the, the coding scheme involves some sort of interaction between the, at least at the decoder side, for that example, for the, the achievable scheme I talked so about. What's your assumption about the channel here? Channel is just discrete memoryless broadcast channel. So P, Y, 1, Y, 2, given X. And the source discrete? Yeah, yeah, everything is discrete in this guy. And this is still uh, lossless? Exactly. So since it's lossless, we have to uh, conditional entropy. So you have to transfer, transmit all the remaining information to the construct S to which you see. So, so did you discuss what the, the converse is? Yeah, yeah, there's a converse there's for this. And this is the, the capacity? Yeah, this is if and only effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so just to show the advantage. Yeah. But yeah, this is best you can do this. The only thing you, you are kind of, I mean, this is if, only, if and only if you have to lose it anyway. But the only thing, for instance, here you might be losing is that you have uh, the, you have to optimize the channel. You have only one channel input, which is the case for it. Basically, you are optimizing over unique PX, which should be good for both. But for instance, if this is a broadcast channel, in which case, the Gaussian input is optimal for both of them. Then for this setup, it turns out actually each user is operating as if it's the sole user. So it's not losing anything <coughs> that there is an additional user, which wouldn't be the case in the general uh, Gaussian channel if, if you were transmitting some rates instead of the common source. Anyway. OK, so th this is the network I will talk uh, about more in detail. It's the, the relay uh, network. <coughs> So the, the simplest case is, of course, a single relay channel. So this is a three-terminal network. We have a source destination and the relay terminal that overhears uh, this Y1 channel output. And it also can help the source basically to transmit this message to the destination. So this is this is a very old uh, problem to introduce in uh, 71, 71. But in terms of the, the channel capacity, to how much, what is the maximum rate you can transmit over this channel, we still don't know the answer. Meaning that we don't have a single better expression that we can uh, calculate. So we don't know how much, what is the best rate for the, for the general setup. For only special cases, uh, the answer is no. But there are many achievable schemes, meaning that there are many techniques that you can use to transmit uh, information over this channel, but uh, none of them are optimal in general. OK, so now I introduce the sign information. So let's look at what happens when we have the, now we have the joint source channel coding problem. So we have the source S at the, the source terminal. And the destination is a correlated sign information, T. Now it turns out that actually, so this is sort of similar to point-to-point -point setting. So what Relay does, you can imagine it as Relay introduces some memory to the system. And actually, the source channel separation theorem for point to point applies for channels with memory as well. So actually, you can show uh, intuitively you, you should expect that the separation will be optimal. And, and actually, this is the case. So you can prove that you, you sh what you should do optimally is first to compress S with respect to T, and then use the optimal channel code for the relay channel, which we don't know. 
So it's kind of interesting that for a, for a uh, network that you don't know the capacity, you, you are showing the optimality of separation. And in the converse, this becomes kind of interesting because actually then, since you don't know the single metric expression, you cannot use it in the converse. So you need to use this emulator capacity expression for this real HMR, which you know. And in general, people have considered this emulator expressions as useless, since you cannot calculate nothing. They are just uh, expressions, basically. It's, it's almost as saying that capacity of this network is the maximum rate you can transmit. <laughs> <laughs> But basically, it turns out here that you can actually use it for some purpose. <laughs> so you can prove the capacity by using this unnatural expression. OK, but the, the more interesting setup is, of course, when there are multiple relays, and all each relay has its own different side information. And now you want to transmit the source S0 to the destination. How? Uh, uh, what is the basically the minimum uh, source channel rate you need to transmit the source S0 to the destination? And of course, since this is a generalization of the channel coding problem, we don't expect to solve this problem. But we want to get some, uh, just basically an achievable to result. And uh, basically, OK, so this is here for the, the sources. As I said, we have this IID, uh, discrete memory source, coming from some joint distribution. And as I said, we have many achievable schemes. So here, I will use this decode and forward relay, meaning that I will have this S0, source S0, to be decoded at each relay node, one after another. And once each relay node decodes the source, it will help the, the source terminal to transmit to the next terminal over the network. So basically, once until it, this gets to the destination, it will be decoded by all the relays in the network. This is uh, decoded and forward relay. So this is the this is the theorem. So here we have only achievability. So basically, if our rate R satisfies this inequality for all possible orderings, uh, these PIs are these permutations over the relays, meaning that you can, of course, change the order. It's not part of the, there's no order imposed by the problem to be the, uh, the decoding orders at the relays. And as long as this is satisfied at each relay, you can transmit this as zero to the destination. So this is a bit complicated. So let's get the, the single relay uh, case. So this rate R is achievable if, so you simultaneously satisfy the the conditional entropy to the relay, so the remaining part of S0 at the relay should be less than the rate that you can transmit to the relay. And the conditional entropy to the destination should be less than the rate you can jointly transmit from the source and the relay to the destination. And here we are optimizing our joint uh, distributions to X0, X1. So the idea basically now the relay will decode the source S0 and then transmit. So of course this is sort of a sub-problem of the, the broadcast channel. As so both the, we want both the relay and the destination to code. So we, now we need to uh, go back and uh, do this joint kind of uh, decoding schemes. And actually, you can also sh uh, prove a converse for this problem for the physically degraded relay channel with physically degraded side information. So if the relay has both the better channel and the side information, you can prove that actually this is required. But the relay has to actually decode the, the source. So now it's. Uh, it's, it's a bit technical, so I will get into the proofs. I think it's really nice if you, if kind of your, uh, you have worked on this relay channel kind of type of problem. I like the, uh, the this uh, how the scheme works, but it might be technical if you are not really uh, working on this kind of problems. So in that case, you can sleep for like uh, five to ten minutes. I'll say when it's over and uh, for the next time. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's fix the rate. So this is given now, this N and M. So the idea is to use this uh, block mark of encoding. What it is done is that so you assume you have a very long uh, source block and you you divide it into many smaller blocks, uh, size size M, and then you transmit each block one after another over different channel blocks. So I will uh, have a picture for this. So in your context that you explained initially, the channel is still static over all blocks. Yeah, yeah. Here, Here now, yeah, that's the channel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's the simple, yeah. Everything is static, the source IID, this person on this channel as well. So now in general, in the in the relay channel, so they have uh, they've introduced different coding and decoding schemes, and all of them achieve the same performance in the context of channel coding. But it turns out actually, and so far people generally, uh, at least for the for the relay channel setup, they always thought these are equivalent. You can use them one or the other. 
there is just a difference in terms of delay, which uh, I, will make, I will explain. But it turns out that in, in the source channel coding setup, depending on the type of uh, decoding you, have to, you want to use, you actually have to pick one of these. So the one, one coding scheme is called regular encoding, which means if the, the, the code book, sizes of code books at the source and the reader are the same, and we call it regular encoding, if they are different, then it's irregular encoding. And at the destination, the type of decoding, uh, we can use two types of decoding. Either you use sliding window decoding, meaning that the, the destination decodes the messages one after another as time goes by. Or you can use backward decoding, meaning that the destination waits until all the blocks are transmitted, and then goes back one after another and decodes uh, basically uh, uh, in the reverse order. So of course, this introduces delay while the sliding window decoding is real-time decoding. But of course, the, the, the complexity is higher in the sliding window decoding. So now I will show, basically, that we can, uh, this R join coding scheme will be useful if depending on the, uh, the coding scheme you will use. So the first one is if you use irregular encoding, different size code books, and backward decoding. In this case, we will show that we can actually use this separate uh, slip involved coding and uh, separate decoding. So now, since you have different size code books at the source and the relay, so first you use uh, you bin your source outcomes with respect to the relay side information, so H S given S zero given S one, and then separately you bin for the destination. So you do this double binning since they have different side informations, and you generate. Uh, so if we call this M two the 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 destination bins, you generate a channel code word for the relay for each destination bin. And for each destination bin, you generate M1 conditional in the independent code words that are code words for the source. So what happens? So in the first block, the relay fixes the some fixed code word, x11, and the source first or the observes the first source block. That is the relay bin index for this block. So uh, with respect to the relay side information, and transmits the corresponding channel code word. So now at the end of uh, this block, so the relay observes this channel code word, decodes it, finds the bin index for itself for, with respect to its side information, and finds the original source block. Uh, that's the jointly typical within that bin. So now at the end of this, uh, relay knows the original source realization. Now, it can also find the destination bin index. So in the second block, uh, the, the relay also transmits basically the, the index with respect to the destination bin index, the, the, the channel code word. And in the second block, the source, on the other hand, transmits uh, this, this double index code word, the index with respect to the destination bin for the previous code, uh, source block, and the, new, uh, the, the, the relay bin index for the new source block. So it goes on basically transmitting simultaneously both the previous and the, the, the next source block. And it goes on like this. So now, as I said, the relay uh, decodes after each block, one after another. And this is the, the necessary condition. So the, the conditional entropy with respect to the relay side information should be less than the rate to the relay. And on the other hand, now the destination waits until the last block. So receives the destination bin index for the last source block and then decodes it, uh, it, it's, it will be successful if this condition is satisfied. Now they are uh, transmitting jointly the relay and the source. And then it goes backwards, subtracting these, uh, these ones. Basically, for the last block, it finds the relay bin index, and then it knows the, the, the corresponding channel code book, and then it goes backwards and decodes everything. So if you want to do this separation, uh, basically, slipping mode coding is meaning, and then channel transmission. You have to do this this backward decoding. You have to introduce delay. So, if you want to simplify and use the separate source and channel codes, you have to introduce delay in the system. But if you don't want to introduce delay, if you want to use the sliding window decoding, now you have to have same size code books at the source and the relay, which which cannot be cannot happen because if you want to be you have to, since they have different quality side information, you have to create different size code books. So then, in that case, so for example, you have to. Is it just that um, it's you, not a, you don't know any other? Yeah, it's not a, yeah. It's not like there's no commerce, of course, that you cannot use. But I mean, kind of intuitively, also, if you want to be, I mean, it's kind of yeah. If you want to be, which is like a different side informations, 
meaning you have, you have to create different size coders, and of course then this requires different size channel coders. So if you don't somehow come up with a different definition of separation or something, then sort of intuitively there is a commerce, commerce argument, it's not a commerce proof. But, but if you use the, the scoring scheme I introduced, now you can actually have same size coders because both the source and the relay simply uh, uh, just basically list all the typical source outcomes and generate for each typical source outcome we, we generate one relay code word and for each relay code word we generate again the same size as 2 to the MHS uh, source code words. So how it happens now basically the source transmits the code word uh, for the first uh, source outcome and then the relay decodes it in a joint source channel decoding fashion and then it has the source, uh, the relay knows the, now the source outcome for the previous block, it transmits its own channel code word in the second block, while the, 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 uh, the source transmits the code word, the code word corresponding to the index, the double index code word, basically the code word coming from this code word for the uh, new, uh, the index corresponding to the new source block and the previous source, source block. Basically they are transmitting now this one, the, the previous source block to the destination in a joint, joint manner with, uh, with the relay. So now basically the, uh, the decoding at the relay, as I said, you have to have this joint decoding, both the source and, uh, source and side information should be jointly typical, and the, uh, the source input and the relay output should be jointly typical for the same index. So this is, uh, this is the requirement, which is the same as the uh, separation. And the, now the destination can have sliding window decoding, uh, using this uh, joint decoding. Basically, the idea in general is that we can actually have uh, sliding window decoding and uh, real-time decoding at the destination if we have, if we don't do this uh, binning, uh, if we don't do any binning at the source or the destination, if we want to have the same size uh, code words at the source and the relay. But on the other hand, if you want to have a simple separation scheme and use the source and channel codes that we have, then we have to introduce delay, uh, at least, again, uh, within the context of all the uh, decoding schemes we know, and we have to apply uh, backdoor decoding at the destination. And of course, as, uh, this is especially bad if you have a larger network, because the delay grows exponentially as the number of uh, relays in the system increase. So just to show kind of a, a numerical uh, explanation of this. So I have here a, a Gaussian setup. So let's say, for instance, the S1 and S2, the source at the, the source terminal and the side information at the relay are coming from joint Gaussian distribution. Here, draw is sort of the quality of the side information at the relay. Now we want to transmit S1 to the destination in lossy fashion in some distortion. Since it's Gaussian, we have to introduce some loss, some distortion. So the classical approach that uh, we all have this uh, cooperation scheme, which is uh, almost always people talk about channel cooperation. It would, in, and th this is the case when we, we want to apply separation. So meaning that you want to first compress the source S1 and use the optimal channel code for this relay. But if you will compress this S1 for destination, that's the target you want to transmit, destination has no side information. So you cannot use S2 for compression because destination doesn't have S2, cannot reconstruct S1. But once you once you ignore S1, you will only use this channel code for the underlying Gaussian channel. You can use any kind of uh, HUL scheme, decode and forward, compress and forward, and and forward for the channel. So this is uh, what you would get. For instance, this red one. So here I have the HUL distortion with respect to the quality of the source to relay link. So this is what you would have just you not using the relay at all for source or uh, channel cooperation. But if you use decode and forward, this is the red curve. Of course, as the source relaying quality increases, you get less distortion. But the, the scheme I introduced, which is this joint source channel cooperation, which uses both the side information and the channel cooperation, is the, the green curves. If you have a low quality side information, of course it improves, but the improvement is very little. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a very good quality side information, as you can see, the improvement is very significant. Intuitively also it's clear because sometimes it's possible, for instance, that the source to relay link 
might feel very bad. There might be some something in between. But maybe the relay observes somehow. Maybe it's a sensor network observing the, the temperature. It's possible that it can measure the temperature almost uh, same as the source, but it cannot receive any transmission. So, but it still can actually cooperate, which uh, we exploit basically in, in this case of joint source chain cooperation. Okay, so now the people who slept for the relay part can wake up. <laughs> so we have a, a kind of trans, uh, transition to a, uh, a slightly different concept, which I will just uh, basically just uh, introducing, I would say, a new concept uh, for data, mostly data transmission over uh, wireless things. So before I was talking about, until this uh, last two slides, uh, lossless transmission. So we had the source S, we wanted to reconstruct exactly with vanishing error probability. But in many cases, like video multimedia sensor observations, we allow actually some loss. So here now I'm talking about, I will talk about mostly uh, transmission over the network, over the, the wireless link, let's say it's a Gaussian, it's the white Gaussian uh, noise channel. So in the classical problem of almost always people talk about is that, okay, you are given this wireless channel, you are given a fixed bandwidth ratio, so meaning that you observe, let's say, M source samples, and you have the use the channel in N channel users, and the ratio of N and M, as I, I, as I had before, is fixed. So you have a certain number of channel users per source sample, and you have a certain amount of power per transmission to transmit this source. And what you get in the end is a power distortion trade-off. So for this given power, what is the minimum distortion you can achieve uh, transmitting this, uh, for transmitting this uh, source over the channel? But on the other hand, actually, in many cases like sensor networks, you are actually not limited in terms of the bandwidth. So you can actually, it's possible that you might be able to use the channel many times or over a uh, large bandwidth, but instead you are limited by the energy. So you have a total energy budget that you can use. Maybe you can transmit very long times. So you don't have so much data arriving. So your goal is actually to reduce, uh, to improve, uh, to improve the performance, distortion performance of this large bandwidth for a given energy budget. So this energy here, we mean that the total cost of using this channel per source sample. So now, basically, what you, you will get out uh, of this is the energy distortion trade-off rather than a power uh, distortion trade-off. So in a more uh, mathematical way, the, the problem is this. So you have, if you, have, you observe the M samples of the source and you want to use the channel N times, for this, uh, for a code uh, corresponding to, to this, we say that the energy per source sample is 1 over m, the total energy, it should be bounded by E, the, the, the total energy available. And the distortion constraint, the achievable distortion is, of course, the usual per source sample additive uh, distortion should be less than D. So the energy distortion trade-off function now, we define as ED. For a given distortion, it's the minimum energy that you need to achieve this average distortion. And here, as you see, we don't bound anything in terms of the bandwidth. So M and N can both go to infinity, and actually you can have infinitely many times uh, use the, the channel for each source sample. So before I was saying, okay, so you can transmit any source if you use the channel uh, enough times by repeating, uh, uh, using the channel many, many times. But here now, you can't do that because actually you have energy limitation. So if you use the channel many times, every time you reduce your uh, power for each kind of transmission, so you are losing. So this is uh, it's kind of a uh, very, I, I would say, fundamental trade-off between the, the energy and the, the, the distortion, the quality of reception of the receiver. So if, you, if uh, we looked at this for a single point-to-point uh, -point system, and it turns out, not very surprisingly, you can actually prove a separation result. So a se separation is optimal. And what you get, your energy distortion trade-off is this EB mean times RD. So what are this? This EB mean is the, the famous minimum energy per bit formula introduced by uh, Sergio Verdu. So this is basically the energy required, the minimum energy required to transmit a single bit over the channel times the rate distortion function, basically the number of bits you need per source sample to achieve this distortion. And of course this is, uh, so you have a converse for this, so this is the, the optimal thing, and you achieve by separation. For an additive white house in most channel, these are known, exactly these both functions, and you can get an uh, exact result. So if you have a feedback, 
what happens. So, uh, we know in general it doesn't improve the, uh, the feedback that uh, does not improve point to point uh, performance. It's the, uh, the same for this case as well for energy distortion trade off. Does not improve the function, but it does is it simplifies the transmission scheme, which now you can use a Shalvik Kaidat scheme for source transmission. Uh, so I'll explain this uh, uh, in a while quickly for a more uh, complicated setup. So now, uh, what happens in a multi user setting? As I said, in general, the separation results don't extend to multi user scenarios. So let's say now you have this S1, S2 correlated, the two encoders, and you want to transmit over a multiple access channel at the white Gaussian, and you have perfect channel output feedback. So this row is again the, the correlation coefficient, the channel, and uh, as I said, we have perfect channel feedback. I look into the, the simple symmetric scenario. So uh, this sigma squares the, the variance of the sources, and we have a positive correlation row. So for this, uh, we first come up with a lower bound, again using these MNET expressions. I won't go into the details. But basically, this is the, the, the minimum energy that's required to achieve a symmetric distortion beam over this uh, channel. So now, uh, basically, uh, in general, we cannot solve this exactly. We cannot find the energy distortion function for this. I will come up with some achievable schemes and compare with this uh, lower bound. So the, achievable, the first achievable scheme is, of course, separation. So you first compress the sources and transmit over the channel. And it, for the uh, multiple access channel, the, the minimum energy per bit is achieved by orthogonal transmission. So you have infinite bandwidth. So there is no point to transmit simultaneously. So you divide the infinite bandwidth into two, still infinite bandwidth for each user. So each can achieve EV mean. And then they, they basically compress the sources and transmit using uh, EV mean. So the compression part is uh, basically distributed uh, compression, the lossy compression for Gaussian sources. It's, it's been recently found, the rate distortion function. You plug that in with this uh, the EB min over this channel for each user. Then you get an achievable uh, energy distortion function. But of course, this scheme first of all does not use the feedback because you are transmitting uh, individually. So, and we know for individual users, feedback is not helpful. So now, can we use the feedback and improve the uh, the performance. So it, we, we are using this uncoded transmission, the one I said for the Shalvik Kailat scheme. What you do is, you don't do any coding, so you observe the source samples, they are correlated, you put them into the channel. So now, they are, because of this correlation, you are forming sort of a beam forming at the destination, and the destination estimates the sources from the, uh, the channel output using MMSC estimation. Now, of course, because of the perfect feedback, both users know the, uh, the estimation of the receiver. And you can find the error in the, the destination estimation for your own source. And each user transmit now in the next channel use the error in the, the uh, receiver estimation. So they continue like this, uh, iterate. And every time, since you observe the error and uh, the error gets smaller, you basically get closer and closer in the destination estimation. So this is uh, this Shalvi Kailat scheme, which was introduced for channel coding. This is sort of this, uh, the source uh, joint source channel coding extension in this uh, in the setup. So this explains this the algorithm. So you get this uh, it's, uh, quite complicated algebra, I would say, but you get a close to an expression for the, the energy requirement uh, of this scheme. So what uh, we show actually is that, okay. First of all, this scheme is optimal if the two extreme cases. If the sources are independent, rho is zero, or if they are fully uh, correlated, meaning they are the same sources. But in general, we, what we prove is a finite energy gap, meaning that the, the, the gap between the lower bound we had and this achievable with this uh, uncoded scheme is, uh, can be bounded by this uh, finite uh, function depending on the correlation. And this is the case even though actually when the distortion requirement goes to zero, in which case you need infinite amount of energy, but still the gap is bounded. And I think, as far as I know, this is sort of the only uh, this finite energy gap bound kind of in the, in the literature, all of this uh, finite capacity gap uh, kind of results. Basically here you can actually, even though we don't know the optimal, now we know that by this scheme we can get uh, very close to the, um, to the lower bound. So this is the numerical results now. So for a low correlation between the sources, 
So we have the lower bound and the uncoded, pretty much the same in all ranges of distortion. So this is the energy requirement. So separation is also very close here because they're almost independent of the sources, so separation is close to optimal. But it gets much worse, of course, when, they are, when the sources become more correlated. So here now, this is the uncoded. As you see, this uh, the finite gap remains, even though this is going to infinity. But the, the gap to the, the, uh, the separation is pretty high. And of course, they all get closer when the, when the distortion form is 1, meaning that you don't need to transmit anything. They all become, uh, the, the energy form becomes 0. So this is, in general, we don't know exactly the comp uh, comparison between, we don't have numerical result, uh, analytical result for the comparison between uncoded and separation. But here, we numerically, we show that actually the, the separation always requires higher energy uh, compared to this uncoded transmission for any co uh, correlation and distortion value. So OK, so uh, I will uh, finish the talk here. So the, the, the main conclusions, I would say, here is that the separation idea that is used widely in all, almost all practical systems is actually can be very, very suboptimal in various multi-user scenarios for non-ergodic uh, channel setups, which I didn't talk uh, much about in this talk, but there are many examples for it as well. And uh, what we should do if we want to operate optimally or near optimal in multi-user scenarios, we have to come up with some either joint source channel schemes, but or, as in the case of the coding scheme I introduced, some still joint uh, coding schemes that have this joint flavor, but still can operate in a modular manner, that you can actually separate the source and the channel coding uh, operations in the, in the code. And then I also introduced this energy distortion trade-off, which I believe is kind of fundamental, especially for this energy efficient uh, networks. Uh, when the energy, energy rather than the bandwidth is the, the main constraint in the system. So, and you have to come up with a different type of uh, coding scheme. So I conclude the talk and um, questions. If 